Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. Our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We bring you weekly topics and thought-provoking guests to get you to stop, reflect and think about what it means to be a leader in a modern world. Our aim is to help you become the leader you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Today's episode is brought to you by my new book, You're a Leader, Now What? The Proven Path to High Performance Leadership. The book contains many of the great lessons that we've been learning together during the Leadership Project podcast, together with many other lessons that I've collected over my 30-year career as a leader. The book is aimed at first-time leaders, but really there's lessons in there for everyone. It would be greatly appreciated if you could go and grab your copy on Amazon as either an ebook or a paperback, and if you could leave us an honest review on Amazon. Now, on with the show. Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honoured today to be joined by Dom Narciso. Dom is a high performance coach who specialises in high achievers and she's got a really interesting background, an international background that we're going to go into today. She helps entrepreneurs, she helps leaders, she helps these high performing individuals to bring out their best. She's also the host of her own podcast show, The Positive Success Show, and we'll probably talk a little bit about that during today's interview. And she's also the author of a book called Live Your New Story, Discover Your Best Self and Live Your Best Life. And it's such a privilege to have you on the show today, Dom. Please say hello to our audience and give us a little bit more of that very rich background and what led you to be with us today. So great. So great to be here, Mick. And thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, yeah, you know, my my story, it really begins in my early 20s when I was a Peace Corps volunteer for the U.S. government and I served in Costa Rica. And I fell in love with this idea of service and teaching and coaching and helping others believe in what's possible. And so fast forward into the future Um, I ended up getting married uh, to my wife, who was a U.S. diplomat, and we started this incredible adventure um, living internationally. Uh, We've lived in Venezuela. We've lived in Peru. We've lived in South Korea. Now we're here in Australia. And throughout that whole process, I went through a lot of um, changes, changes in terms of my identity as an American, as a single person to a married person, and then to a mom. (laughs) And then transitioning from a full-time career as an international affairs professional to a full-time entrepreneur, author, speaker. And so I, I, there's so much, Vic. <laughs> I can't like, I can't really, I mean, summarize, but essentially my life has been constant change and constant leveling up of my identity. And as I've learned how to do that, I've helped others, other who are also high achieving, Understand that as you get older and life gets more complex, it's so critical to get fine to get focused on what it is that really brings you joy and what it is that you're really good at. Because you get those two things together, you know, everything else in your life just gels. But if there's any sort of incongruence with any with with what brings you joy and what you do for a living, it creates a lot of friction in terms of how you're expressing yourself in the world. And so for the high performers out there, you know, we can all like, I'm sure there's listeners, high achievers, you know, you're always going to be successful because you just know how. But the question is, are you being successful in the thing that brings you the most joy? And that is, that is the, that is the deeper question that I think if you're in a career or you're in a lifestyle or you've been living a certain way for a decade, two decades, it's so hard to shift. But then I've seen people shift, like I've helped clients shift. And it's like they suddenly blossom into this other human being that was always there, but never created, you know, the environment in which to let that express itself. So that's a little deep, (laughs) but that's, but that is, that is essentially what I help high achievers do is, Hey, you're already high achieving. 
let's get you to a different level where you're expressing yourself fully and completely, you know, unapologetically, like do the thing that you want to do, live the life that you want to live. And, um, and in doing so, you give courage to others who see you as a role model. They're like, oh, wow, you stepped outside of that box or you did this. Like, I could never do that. Like, of course you can. We can all step outside of the box if we want to. Wow, Dom, there's so many powerful messages there already. This is going to be a fabulous interview. I can't wait to unpack all of that. I'm hearing a number of really key things there. I'm hearing about that search for identity. Who am I? Who am I really? The search for success, but searching for success in a way that brings true joy and fulfillment. And I'd love to continue to unpack this. I'd like to take a few steps back. And you started off with talking about service of others. And you were a volunteer in the Peace Corps. You traveled to Costa Rica, 20 something years old going out of the US and discovering this big world and this thought about the service of others. What did you learn about yourself in that part of the journey? You know, um, those two years being away from family and being away from the comforts of Los Angeles. So I grew up in California um, and, you know, such a, such a wonderful state to grow up in. I, I really learned what it means to be an American. And I didn't realize how American I was until I was outside of my comfort zone. And so I was suddenly challenged with different cultural values, uh, different ways of being. Everything that I thought was true was suddenly flipped on its head um, because I was just living in a different culture and I had to assimilate into that culture in order to be successful. And the Peace Corps, what it really taught me was. When you are fully giving, you know, all that you have to learn about another culture, you are filling your soul up so much. It's like for anyone that's, that's lived in a different culture and has immersed themselves in the culture and really learned about it and spoke the language, you, you start to see the humanity of, of it all. Like we're all looking for more love. We're all looking for happiness. We're all looking for, you know, a sense of peace. And sometimes we may seek all of these things outside of us, but in the reality is it's already in front of, it's right in front of you, you know, your partner, your spouse, your family, your community, like all those things that you need as a human being, it's all right there in front of you. Uh, It's just a matter of seeing it and fully appreciating it. And so in the Peace Corps in Costa Rica, Costa Ricans are super, super welcoming and they welcomed me into their homes. Um, they were always feeding me great food. We were always having great coffee and chats about life and what it's like in America, like and what Costa Ricans are like. And, and it was just this, this genuine, it was like a genuine experience of humans getting to know each other and trying to understand one another. And it was really great. Like I, I learned, I mean, I can go on and on about Peace Corps, but I learned so much about just being present and being fully, um, fully engaged. And I think because I lived in a rural town in a coffee farming community, um, there wasn't a lot of, you know, things to do. You're, I would sit in my hammock and read. Uh, I would go over to a neighbor's house and have a chat. You know, I would play with their dog or their baby. And, and it was just, life was simple. And in the simplicity, there's so much, there's so much aliveness in it. Wow, there's so many things to unpack there again, uh, Don. Thank you, thank you so much. This this is amazing. What I'm hearing from you there is that that people have fundamentally the same needs. Like so, regardless of whether you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs or Glass's choice theory, it all comes down to things like the need for survival, the need for love and belonging, the need to feel like we matter and that we have a purpose, the need for fun. Uh, can also come in there and also that need for freedom. So I'm hearing that as you've traveled to all and lived and worked in all of these different countries, that that fundamental human need is still there, but it just presents itself differently from a cultural perspective. Tell us more about that. All right. So every country that I've been to from Costa Rica to Peru, to Venezuela, to South Korea, Essentially, what, I, what I've seen and how I've been able to thrive in all of those cultures is that I understand that humans, as human beings, we all just want to be seen. 
And that is what I, like, essentially, if I were to break down what I do as a coach and what I'm good at, it's I, I give people a space to be seen and to talk and to be heard without judgment. And so I think it's that piece of judgment that when you go to a new country and you're like, oh, things are done this way. Like, I don't do it like that in my country. So that's instantly a judgment. Or you meet someone from a different culture and they say something and you, you know, it's, it's kind of off for you. But then if you go into those situations with an open mind, open heart, you know, willingness to learn growth mindset, right? Like all of these things that allow you to be, to explore and experience the fullness of humanity. Like there's so, there's so much, there's so much, so much out there to learn. And if you're open to it, you see the thread that is connecting all of us. And that is just, we're all, we all want to be seen. We all want to belong and we all want to have fun. Like life is about having, you know, enjoying it. It's not this long struggle of like every day is, you know, is hard. It's yes, there are hard days, but you move through it. Different cultures move through difficulties in different ways, but essentially we're trying to just live a good life. And there's a choice at a certain point, whether or not you're going to say like, okay, I'm done. I, I, I don't want to do it anymore. Like I'm, I'm a failure in my culture or I'm a failure in this space. Or you decide, you know, what can I do to learn? What can I do to grow? How can I see this in a different way? What am I doing that I need to shift my perspective so I can move forward? And so there are all these layers of, you know, cultural nuances that you start to, well, at least I've, I've started to really embrace because I see like, because I've seen so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of cultures. I'm like, oh, this person is driven by this. This person is driven by this, or these folks are driven by this, or this is what's important here. And then ultimately we all just want to be seen <laughs> as simply, as simply as it's, as it's, uh, uh, it's, it sounds so simple. Um, but that's, I, I truly believe that that is, that is a human need is to be seen and to be loved and, you know, to be appreciated, uh, no matter what culture you come from. And when you don't have that, you know, that is the beginning of, um, of, of challenge of internal challenge and identity, um, identity crisis and like, who am I and self-worth, all of those things that come with not being seen and being judged by others. Mm. There's three, three really powerful things there. Dom, if I can play it back to you and see what you think. The first one is the self-awareness of, hey, we want to be seen and knowing that, but then immediately pivoting that with a level of empathy to realize that actually everyone else that you cross paths with in your life, guess what? They want to be seen as well. And the third element is perspective and to realize, start seeing the world through their eyes and realize that they see it in a different way. So their version of being seen, their version of what respect looks like may be culturally different to yours. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just culturally different. But at the heart of it, they just want to be seen and they want to feel like they matter. How does that sound? Ooh, you're giving me goosebumps, Mick. No, that is, I think that hits it. You, you hit it right on. I think that is it. And because we, each human being, we have our own experiences, our own cultural upbringing. Uh, we bring a very, we bring our unique perspective to the world, our unique experience. But when you look at another person, you can't assume, even though they look like you and they grew up in the same town as you, or you can't assume that they've had the same experience as you. You have to purely listen, like because you may not understand. And that listening they, without judgment that you without mentioned. Without judgment, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so, um, yeah, no, but that's I think that's a yeah, that's a great a great point, Nick. <laughs> Brilliant. The the other thing that you uh, said before, Dom, that really got my interest is that when people are out there searching, and let's let's face it, I think the majority of people in the world are searching for something. Call it the pursuit of happiness, call it the pursuit of success, what, whatever you want to call it, people seem to be out there searching for something, but they're searching outwards. And what I, a powerful thing I heard in your initial introduction is that something shifts when you start looking inside and realizing it's been there the whole time. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I think um, as you're as we grow up and we see, you know, this is what it looks like to be successful. You know, you see it in the media, or you see it with your parents, or you see it with your friends' parents. 
um, you start to develop these frameworks or these paradigms in which you understand, I must do this in order to achieve that. So it's like, like A, B, C. However, as you get older, and if you choose to start to dis- dismantle that paradigm and ask the question, well, what does success really mean to me? Then you start to look inward versus outward. Because if I were to say like, okay, success in, um, you know, in a certain country is, you know, you have a great house, you have two kids, you have a two cars, you know, you have the dog, all these things, great, that's success. But then when you challenge that, when you challenge everything that you think is true, you challenge it like, well, let me ask a different question. If I were to flip this on its head and say like, well, if I were to create my own definition, what would that look like? And I think that is very, it's very confronting to a lot of people because suddenly you're confronted by your own choices that you've made. And if they're good choices, great, or they're just choices, but then you have to understand you're ultimately responsible for what you have in your life. Every choice that you've made, like anything, any, like from your career to your partner, to having kids or not having kids, to where you're living, like that's ultimately, like those are your choices. But then the question is, were you following this external roadmap that people gave you? Or were you following your internal voice that may not have all the answers, but is whispering to you saying, hey, you should go try this, even though other people don't think you should do that. So I'll give you a perfect example. When I went to join the Peace Corps, everyone around me was saying, don't join the Peace Corps. But then in my heart, I knew, oh no, but I'm curious about it and I want to go explore it. And so what's great is that if you have, not if, everyone has curiosity. If you allow your curiosity to take you where you're unsure, but it's exciting, like that is, that is your unique path. You don't have to follow everybody else, like go your own way. And I think in that sense, when you look internally, you are essentially creating your own unique path in your own life because you're a unique person. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well done, Tom. I, I really uh, love where you're taking this. And I think I, I want to pass a, um, a thought here and get your views on it. I feel like the world that we live in today that issue is actually magnified. So we live in an Instagram world where everyone's comparing themselves to what society labels as success. Yeah. But that Instagram world, I'm going to call it how it is. There are some authentic people on Instagram, but what you're seeing on Instagram is what people want you to see. It's not really them and it's not really what's going on inside them. And the sooner you stop comparing yourself to the outside world and and what the outside world labels as success and find what makes you happy, the sooner you can progress. Is that what I'm hearing? Oh, absolutely. I think, so I I like to look at the Instagram world as here are all these different ways to live. Here are all these different flavors of different kinds of people. This is what this person likes. This is what that person likes. And your job is to not compare yourself, but to choose and select like what would I, it's a different way to look at, look at the Instagram world. You know, what would I choose differently in my life that would push me forward? Oh, look at this person. They're being brave in this way. What can I do? Um, and that's, that's the different way that I would look at it. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately, you know, all of these v- versions of success, they're just versions of success. And it's up to you, the individual as a high achiever, as a leader to really define what does success mean to you? I really like what you said there about picking and choosing too, Dom. Uh, So it's not like finding someone's life on Instagram and going, I'm going to mimic that person. I want to be like them. It's going, oh, I really like, like you said, they challenged themselves and went and they were brave and took on some kind of challenge. What does my version of that challenge look like? Not to mimic it. Yeah, really good. All right. You coach high achievers. Can I ask do you find that this kind of outward kind of search for success, et cetera, is more prevalent in the high achiever community compared to the general population? What, what's different about high achievers from your experience? So I, I would say that there's a, there's a spectrum of high achievement. There are folks that have been high achieving all of their life and they've gone, you know, 
they've made partner at the business, they've, you know, they've won, won awards, they're really good at their skill. And so there's high achievers that just keep going and they never stop to question, is this the path that is true for me? They just do it. There are those folks and super high achieving, but there's a moment where something inside them says, I need a change and I don't know what it is. And so that is, that is a challenge. And that's what I see with a lot of high achievers that go all the way with, you know, their careers. And then there are the high achievers that realize at a certain point in their, in their life, that if they don't change, this bugging feeling will never leave them and they'll feel that sense of regret. And so these high achievers, these are the ones that start reading a lot of the personal development books. They start asking themselves those questions on their own accord. You know, they start teaching themselves, like, what do I need to do in order to get to know myself better? And so I think that question of who am I, like, very, very intense question. Like, if I were to go into a room and ask someone, like, who are you? You know, they'll probably say, I'm so-and-so. This is where I work. I have, you know, I'm married to this person. And everything is revolved around these external accomplishments. But if you were to ask someone, like, who are you? The person that did the work on themselves the person that asks the deeper questions, the person that is journaling and reading and reading maybe spiritual texts or, you know, they're searching for who they are and they're open to it. Those folks have different answers and they are serving at a higher, they see themselves as serving a higher calling and whatever it is that, however that's expressed in their career or their life or their personal life, they see themselves as a, as a vessel for doing good in the world. And it's their responsibility to build up themselves so they can build and inspire others. Yeah, really good, Dom. So I'm hearing uh, a few things there. So the first one, when you talk about who are you and most people that haven't given it any deep thought will paint a word picture that is how the world sees them. Whereas perhaps that one that has done the deep work, the reflective work to really look inside themselves, they're going to answer more about how they see themselves in the world, right? So not how the world sees them, but how they see themselves in the world. That's, that's really interesting. I want to now expand on something else because it's come up at least three times in the interview so far. You've talked about the service of others. You've talked about a higher calling and we've talked about joy and fulfillment. Tell us about the connection here. Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, I think at a certain point when you've accomplished all that you've set out to accomplish, just serving your own needs will no longer bring you joy. It will no longer bring you happiness. It will no longer bring that sense of satisfaction. And, and, and you'll get to the point where you're just going through the motions and there's no, there's no pull. There's no pull on you to, to do better, to be better. I'll share with you um, an example of a story that I heard from another entrepreneur. Uh, This person, I I don't have the name in in my mind right now, but I'll share the story. This person owned like basketball teams, sports teams, multi, you know, multi-millionaire yachts, all of these five houses, you know, a couple car, like beautiful cars. And he realized that he just kept getting more and acquiring more and more and more. And so one day, one of his other friends like, Hey, why don't you, why don't you come with me? Um, we're going to go to this. Um, I think at the time I forget which country it was, but, uh, we're going to go bring medical equipment to this country and there's wheelchairs, all this stuff, all this medical equipment for, you know, lots of kids. They, they don't have these, this medical equipment. So they go over, they drop off this metal medical equipment. And, um, one of the boys grabs his face and says, It always makes me tear up because it's such a beautiful story. I want to remember your face because when I see you in heaven, I like, I want to, you know, thank you. And it's so beautiful because it's that, it's that. So when you talk about service, joy, higher calling, um, it's not, it's not the stuff. It's like, are you using your life? to bring joy and happiness to others, especially if you have so much, because at a certain point, you're going to, we're all going to pass. And what's the stuff? The stuff is just still going to be there. (laughs) But then if you use your life in a way where you can really impact others, you can really change, like literally change their life by doing this one thing, like choose that path. If you have the power to do so, 
because, you know, in terms of acquiring more and more stuff, you can always, it, it, it's never ending. It's a never ending race to acquire. I mean, and then ultimately who wins? I don't know. <laughs> or what is, what does winning mean really? And in my, in my life, in my experience, winning is, is really about serving and community and creating these spaces where people feel safe and they feel seen and these higher values of humanity, you know, love, respect, honesty, integrity, that is celebrated versus, you know, running this race and trying to get more and more and more. But for what, like this greed, jealousy, you know, comparing oneself, like that's not in my, in my mind, like that is not what we should be aspiring to. We should be aspiring to things that, you know, you're gifted with a certain skill set. You're a great businessman or businesswoman. You're a great doctor. You're a great teacher, whatever it is that you're great at, keep on being great at those things and then serve others. Because we only need, I mean, according to happiness studies, like $70,000 US dollars after you make more than that, it doesn't necessarily bring you more happiness. It's just more money. And so the question is like, what are you doing differently? Or what can you do differently in order to bring more joy and more fulfillment and more aliveness to your life? And a lot of that has to do with relationships. It's not material things, it's relationships. Money is always going to be a tool to bring us, you know, things, experiences that we want, but ultimately it's the relationships that we create in our lives that we invest in, um, that make us feel a part of something that make us feel seen and connected. Yeah. Really powerful, Dom. I want to play back a quote that we had from one of our previous guests. And I think sums up a little bit of what you're saying. And that was Kimberly Abbott. And one of her things was that it's not the It's not what you do that's important. It's the impact of what you do and that ability to help another human being. For anyone that hasn't really looked deeply at this in the audience, and I feel like most of you may be because we speak about it a lot, that's where true joy and fulfilment comes from. And I'm talking about renewable joy that continues. When you know that you've helped another human being and then you see them flourish, the intrinsic joy that comes from that it, it's, I don't know, I wish I could bottle it somehow. It's, it's, it's so much more enjoyable, uh, enjoyable than any kind of personal success that you might have had by knocking it out of the park yourself. When you help someone else knock it out of the park, it somehow feels 10 times better and lasts 10 times longer. That's, that's my view on that, Dom. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's great. All right, now I want to talk about the book. So uh, Live Your New Story discover your best self and live your best life. What what inspired you to write it? Oh gosh, Uh, my 10 years of professional identity crisis. (laughs) I think, um, so, so going back to, you know, this meaning of success and, you know, external achievement and accomplishments, I was totally on that boat uh, growing up in Southern California, you know, I was a straight A student, you know, went to really good schools, got the internships, got the jobs. And at a point when I wasn't able to work uh, because we were living abroad. It really, I, I realized, and not, not, not at the time, but looking in retrospect, I put all of my identity in my career, all of it. And so when the career went away, I didn't know who I was. And I struggled because all I did all my life was achieve. And I, and I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. But then when I was suddenly faced with I can't work, you know, for several months or for a year or two. I was like, well, what do I do with myself? Who do I want to be now? What, what's going to be my next thing? What's my next goal? And so I wrote, I wrote the book because a lot of um, family members of, of diplomats, uh, depending on where you live, it may be hard to have that continuous career that you could have uh, living in your home country. And so they're faced with these questions like, what do I do now? who am I going to be here? No one knows me here. (laughs) Um, How am I going to pursue my gifts or pursue my ambition? And so I wrote the book in terms of helping those who are in that transition. Um, You know, maybe folks that have lost a job and they're trying to figure out what do they want to do next, or maybe they don't want that career anymore. And they're trying to move into something completely new. Um, It's this book about really getting to know yourself and then exploring what your options are, and then choosing what path to take, and then building up your skill set in order to take that new path confidently. And so it's really this, it's a process to live a new story, because if you've always been telling yourself, I am this person, 
I, you know, this is who I am in the world. And suddenly you're faced with, well, who do I want to be now? You got to start telling yourself a different story. Yeah. I I think this uh, is a story that repeats itself across multiple kind of areas. Sportsmen, like sports people that achieve the pinnacle of their sports career and then afterwards have this empty feeling of, well, what's next? Like uh, Anthony Trucks, NFL star, talks about this a lot, that he labelled himself as I'm Anthony Trucks NFL superstar and then his <laughs> career ends and who is he now? Now he's managed to reinvent himself but but I think a lot of people go through a very tricky transition and that can happen in the business world as well. I am, you know, person XYZ, CEO of company Y or whatever the case might be, they label themselves instead of who they really are. Yeah, really interesting. You have a seven-step framework. Can we unpack that and talk more about oh, yeah. the process Absolutely. that you take people go I got, through? I got, I got my book here. <laughs> oh, yeah, good. For, for those watching the video, there's the book, a wonderful cover and, uh, yeah, yeah, very good. All right, tell us about the seven-step so, framework. So, so seven, and this, and this definitely took me a decade to learn, you know, all the personal development books, all the, you know, books on success on, you know, just growing oneself. So the first is really about self-awareness, reflecting, reflecting on all of your accomplishments, reflecting on all of your challenges, um, reflecting on who you have been in the world. And that's so important for any type of change because that self-awareness is going to be your foundation for choosing what to do next. So that's stage one is to reflect. And the second is to explore based on what you've done in the past, based on your previous dreams, are there any other things that you are looking to do, to experience, to try out, to experiment with? And I think it's that exploration phase that really creates a lot of anxiety for people. It's like, oh, I'm already this age, or I have kids now, I can't do that. Or, you know, and and there's a lot of stories that come up for us saying like, oh, you you can't, are you sure you can do this? Are you really capable of making this pivot can you really transition into that other career or you know live in that country and then so that exploratory phase is so important because it really helps you get a feel for like do I really want to go this direction or not and then when you come up against those notions of are you capable of doing this these are these are the beliefs that you have about yourself and so the third part of the framework is challenging your own beliefs about what you're capable of and I think that of the whole framework is the most difficult part because you're literally telling yourself to believe different things about yourself. So if you're moving, you know, if you've never ran a marathon and then now you you decided like, I want to run a marathon, but then the doubt comes in your mind, like, well, I don't know if I can run a marathon or am I capable of doing it? That's when you start telling yourself, I am capable of running the marathon. I'm going to challenge this belief. I can train for it. I can build up to it and start living into this new identity as a runner. That's just an example. And so overcoming the beliefs, the the limiting beliefs that you have, the fourth part of the framework is to grow, you know, really taking in all the information, all the education, all the mentors, all the coaches that you can learn from in order to step into this new place in your life. So if you're looking to become an entrepreneur, learning from other successful entrepreneurs. I'm sure Nick, you know, you've, you've spoken to so many different kinds of people, you know, it's, and it's, it's the same, right? Like anytime you want to grow, learn from the best. And so you're going to be a student for a certain phase. And as you're a student, when you start implementing, this is part five of the framework, you transform, you literally start transforming yourself from the inside out. You know, the way that you're presenting yourself, the way that you're speaking to others, the way that you're expressing who you are in the world. It's it's shifted. It's a small shift. And as you keep becoming that next version of yourself, part six of the framework is to thrive. What can you do to continually up-level this new identity? And then the last part, for those that want to go deeper, (laughs) is you awaken. You awaken to your true self. You awaken to who you are and what you're capable of becoming. And I think for me all my life, I thought of, I need to be working for an institution. I need to be doing this. Like that's the story I was telling myself. But then 
when I got turned into or tuned into entrepreneurship where it's like, you can be anything that you want to be. You can build any business that you want to build. So what are you going to build? I think that for me was really, really exciting. And when I went down that path, I really did awaken something within me. That's a force. Like I get up every day excited to do the work that I do. There's some days where it's hard, but I'm, I'm so, I'm so connected to my purpose. I'm so connected to how I'm showing up in the world. And at this point in my life, I cannot imagine doing anything else. Like I just can't imagine it because I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So just to summarize, it's reflect, explore, challenge your beliefs, grow, transform, thrive, and awaken. Wonderful, uh, Domi. You've described it really well. Can I ask a, a few questions on it? Is, uh, once you go through that process, is it, is it a one-time thing or is this something that you're continuing to explore as you go? You can, I mean, it's, it's, you continually, you continually go through the process. I think every time you level up to a new identity or to a new way of life, there's going to be a point where things start to plateau and you're like, oh, I've got this. I've mastered this. What can I master next? And I think it's that consistent striving for not, not more, but challenge. How can I challenge myself as I continually evolve as a human being? And, and that sense of challenge really pushes you to new heights. I can see that. It's like an evolving thing that the more you learn about yourself, the more you can multiply this impact that you're talking about. And Dom, I, it's clear to me that you love what you do and you do what you love. And that's something that I find as well, right? And, and it is true. So to everyone out there, like some people might feel like this is a dream, but it is true when you find something that brings you joy and fulfillment, it doesn't feel like work anymore. It doesn't mean that it's going to be all laughs and giggles every day. Of course, there's bumps in the road, but every day you wake up with new energy because you love what you do and it really can happen. And you can create your own version of that once you have that awareness that, that Dom is talking about. I want to unpack just a couple of bits because uh, I, I want people to be inspired to read the whole book, uh, Dom. But let's let's unpack a little bit around reflect and explore and I'd like to offer an opinion and then get your views on it so so what I was hearing there and reflect and explore is to have a think back in previous jobs that you've had in previous things that you've done and really think about what brought you joy right so and I mean what was it about it not what not what were the things but what was it about it so when I was doing this job I really liked this part but I hated this part well, what was it about that part that you loved? Not just the activity, but what was it that brought you joy? That was one thing that I heard. And then the other thing is still this service of others, exploring how what you do helps another human being. And that can really help you reflect and explore and find your purpose. How does that sit with you? And can you ex expand more? Yeah, you know, I, 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 love, I love what you just said. I think if you look at your past all the way back to your childhood and you think about the experiences where you felt fully yourself, you felt alive, you felt connected, you were engaged, like you can vividly remember what you were doing. I, I mean, right now I can clearly think about a time when I was in eighth grade and I was, um, I was, I was hosting a, a school rally and I was the MC and I organized it and I did it and I was cheering, you know, getting the, the crowd to cheer. That for me was, that was me being me. But at the time, like, I didn't recognize that that was me being me. I just thought like, oh, I'm doing this thing and having this life experience. Fast forward to the future. You know, there's going to be moments any, in any type of job that I've had, any time that I'm gathering people, and it's usually around food, <laughs> challenging them to think about their next goal, challenging them to think better of themselves, challenging them to be better to each other. And it comes in all different contexts, like as a leader, as not a leader, you know, as, you know, just someone on the low, low in the totem pole. But I'm in these spaces where I'm able to express that part of myself. That brought me joy. But you have to, like, I had to reflect on those different jobs to pinpoint what was it about this job that I really enjoyed? What did I do with my time there? What impact did I leave? 
and it became very clear to me in um, when I was in Peru and I was serving as a consular officer. I was doing a leadership, like a leadership workshop with uh, with the staff, and I just I felt it again. That same feeling that I had in eighth grade, like oh, and it, and and finally, right, like <laughs> light bulb moment. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is it. I'm supposed to be using this skill set because I'm good at it. I'm intuitively, I know how to work the room. I know how to engage people. I know how to make them laugh. I know how to make them like, you know, cry, like all these different things. I'm, I'm just, that's just who I am. And in a certain way, like I'm a total perform. It's like, I'm, it's a performance, but then it's also a type of engagement where you're trying to level people up in the way, in the way that you're being. Um, and then to your second, the second point. So in finding the things that bring you joy, when you're happy and you're joyful and you're engaged, you are that you being your best serves others because you being your worst, it doesn't serve others. And we've had experiences of people, you know, bosses, coworkers, family members that are just unhappy and they bring the mood down, they bring the energy down. So if you're able to identify like, what is it that you just enjoy doing? And for everyone, it's different. For some people, you know, they want to research and like, you know, be quiet in a room and that's when they're in their zone. And that, you know, like it just, it depends on who you are and what you, what you're into. And that's why it's so important to reflect on who you are, like, and to fully embrace that. And one of the, one of the challenges though, Mick, is that to express who you truly are and, and to not get judged by it. That's, I think that's the hard part is that a lot of us may have gotten judged at a certain point by our parents, by peers, whatnot, that we start to shy away from who we truly are. And then you start choosing a path that's not truly congruent with that part of yourself that's alive and joyful and happy. And so I think that happens, that happens. And then as you know, adults, you got to figure it out. Like, what do I want to do next? (laughs) I want to reflect something back to you there about uh, the first example that you gave there. And you spoke about that rally. And then you spoke about now in later years where you might get gather people around food. That seems like a common thread there. Um, but you, you acknowledged your ability to work a room, et cetera, et cetera. But what I heard was something deeper there. I heard the intersection of skill meets impact. So you have a natural skill. You're a very engaging person. You're, um, you're in New Zealand, we would describe it as mana. You have mana when you walk in the room and you have instant presence and people tend to gravitate towards you. You've got that charisma, all of those things going for your dom. That's a skill. But you then put that skill to meaningful impact and that's where great things happen. And I think everyone can maybe reflect on that. You've all got your own superpowers. You've got, everyone's got their kryptonite, but every single person on this planet's got a superpower. And if you can in- intersect that superpower to some need, where you can have great and meaningful impact. That's where joy can happen. Any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, no, I think, I think that's, that's, that's so, you're, you're good. You're good, Mick. <laughs> you're, you're, you're great at bringing these ideas together. Um, no, absolutely. Like if you know that you're great at something, you know, be great and be good. Like be great and be good to others. And that's, it's so simple, right? Be great and be good. You can be great and be, you know, not good. You can be a jerk. I mean, there's a lot of those people in the world. But be great and be good. And that has ripple effects on every life that you touch. You know, you're nice to that person. And I'm just saying like, you know, I'm driving. I let the person in in front of me, you know, like, right? And then that person goes on their merry way. Same thing with work. You know, you ask, you request something from someone. You ask them in a polite way, maybe joke around with them a little bit. Build that rapport. Like that stuff is important because human beings, we're not, we're not machines. You don't just push a button and like we output something. We are human. We are beautiful, beautiful beings and we're emotional beings. And so if you're a leader, you're a high achiever, you're a high performer, and you want to move people, you got to know how to move their emotions. And people tend to level up when they feel good. So first off, work on yourself. Make sure you got your ducks in a row. Feel good about what you're doing. Be joyful in what you're doing and then pass that on to the next person and be the role model. So be great at what you do and then be good to others. It's so, it's so simple. (laughs) And, and it's, 
it's, it's what's needed. Like we need this, we need this desperately right now in all aspects of our lives, like everywhere you go. The, be this, great at what you do and be good. Go there's two really powerful things there. I'll, I love that one. Let's start with that one. Be, be great at what you do and enjoy mm-hmm. that, but mm-hmm. be good. Do something good with it. Do something meaningful that impacts other human beings. The other thing you brought up a little while ago was about asking yourself some questions. How are my actions, even if it's your attitude that day, how is it serving you and how is it serving others? And give yourself an honest kind of scorecard on that from some uh, – I like the one that you gave about the, the traffic, right? Uh, not cutting someone off. How is it really serving you to cut someone else off? And how does it serve them by not doing it, letting them get on with their day, right? So little actions, the way you show up impacts other people around you. So think about, okay, how am I showing up today? Is that serving me well? Is it serving other people well? I really like that question that you've brought up there, Dom. I want to go to a a challenging one. Um, Challenge your beliefs, the third step, and limiting beliefs. I think we all have them. What is Dom's advice on how we start having another look, taking a new, fresh look at our limiting beliefs? How do we start that process? Yeah, I I would say um, anytime you're, anytime you feel you're trying to make a change in your life, it could be in health, it could be in finances, it could be in career, it could be in your parenting, and you feel resistance. Like you feel like you, you, you feel something's just not not right. And you don't, and your actions in that space of your life are not what you want them to be. You want them to be better. The question to ask yourself is, why do I get stuck in eating better food? Why is my bank account not what I want it to be? Why is my relationship with my spouse or my kids the way it is? What can I do to be better? And in those moments where you feel like you feel those emotions, those negative emotions of anger or resentment or frustration, not to ride the emotions, not to ride those emotions for a day, two days, three days, four days, five days. It's to be aware of them and ask yourself, why does this situation trigger this emotion in me? What is it about this situation that makes me upset? And then from there, looking back into your past, what do I believe about parenting? What do I believe about money? What do I believe about health? And then you'll start to identify the stories that may have been unconscious all of this time until you ask yourself that question. And it's like shining a light, not on the external, but within your own mind. Like, what do you believe about these things? What do you believe about success? What do you believe about good food, like food and nutrition? What do you, like all these things that we want to change about ourselves. What do you believe about it? What is the story behind it? And then a a, a level deeper, where did you learn that story? And it's the where you learn that story. And it's not to blame anyone in the past or anything, but to be aware of it, to be conscious of it. Like if my parents were to say, you know, making money is hard. Or money is hard to come by. My money story is going to be money is hard to come by, but I'm not even aware of it. And I'm having all these struggles about money in my own life. But it's not until I ask myself those questions or know to ask myself those questions. What do I believe about money? That can start to challenge the belief. Yeah, really good. Mm. (laughs) It requires a coach sometimes. (laughs) It it does. And that's where where coaching can be great to help you with those those reflections. Um, the, I heard a number of powerful things there, if I can play back to you, that you started with emotion and you were essentially challenging people to, when you feel these emotions, ask your question, why this emotion, why this emotion now and what triggered it? So that was powerful. And then when you have these beliefs, notice and name those beliefs and then see where it came from. And then when you can see where it comes from, then you can actually challenge and go, Okay, was that even true in the first place? Yeah, really powerful, Tom, and very positive. Like that's a positive one for everyone out there who may be experiencing limiting beliefs. I think we all have them. 
this is a very powerful process that Dom's talking about. All right, Dom, that, that probably is a good one for us to leave on because I think that gives us all some homework to go and think about, go and think about those p- emotions that we feel, those limiting beliefs and start challenging them. So thank you so much for today. I'd love to go to our rapid round now and, and to ask you the questions we ask all of our guests. So the first one, this is interesting because of what you did when you were 20. Um, what's the one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? Gosh, I, I wish, I wish I knew more about I wish I'd ask myself the question, what does success mean to me in my own way? Like, I wish I asked myself that question and, and had a process to really think about it versus looking outside, but to trust myself. Um, I think I would have been on a very different path um, if, I had, if I had known that, to, to even ask that question. I just didn't. I just thought, this is what success is, and I ran with it. Yeah, nice. So, yeah, I like I it a lot. Do. All right, what's your favorite book? Oh gosh. Um, the alchemist. I love, love, love the alchemist. Just such a, such a great, you know, great book about, you know, coming home to oneself, you know, and really seeing that you can go on all these grand adventures, but the answer is always within you. And it's so poetic, right? But it really is like your genius, your superpower, everything that you're looking for, it's already within. And the only thing you have to really do is to believe, to believe that that's you know, to believe in it. Nice. I like it a lot. What's your favorite quote? So this quote literally changed my life. It, it shifted my paradigm on success. And it's by Jim Rohn. And it's success is not something you achieve. It is something you attract by the person you become. So I realized, oh, I need to become somebody else not somebody else that's not true to myself but somebody that is able to attract the things that I want in my life the things that are unique to me and authentic for me and whereas before I just thought get this degree get that job get this get this but then I had it backwards I'm like no I gotta work on who I am and level that up and then everything else will just start to attract will just start to come Mm, to me that's a really powerful quote I want to unpack it just briefly and just say that if you can find that authentic self and then yep. you can express mm. who you are with deep clarity, then you'll attract people around you that believe the same things you believe. And that's when great things can happen. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. cool. All right. And finally, uh, Dom, I'm sure that there's people in the audience now going, uh, <laughs> this is what I need. I need help with this. <laughs> How do people get in contact with you? How do they get a copy of the book? How do they engage you for coaching or, or, you know, what's the best way for them Uh, to get hold of you? Absolutely. I I would say, I would say the first thing is to go to my website, uh, www.domnarciso.com and, you know, sign up for my, my weekly success newsletter. That's how I stay in contact with my audience, you know, with people that want to learn from me, my, my way of seeing the world and my way of, (laughs) you know, achieving success. And then second, you know, the book is on Amazon and in terms of one-on-one coaching or group coaching, happy to jump on a call with anyone. Just connect with me first via my website and then, yeah, and then we go from there. Just looking to connect with other high achievers, heart-centered, ready to serve, ready to lead, you know, and ready to get, ready to live a bigger life. Like, I think it's all within us. And, you know, Mick, what you're doing with your podcast and your work and, um, you know, congratulations again on your book. It's it's incredibly important for us to continue this path of becoming better because as Nick, you grow. And as I grow, you know, we're lifting all the people that we're in touch with, all the people that we're making, you know, we're impacting. And so if you're listening right now and you're inspired by this interview, (laughs) you know, just, just start, start doing the work on yourself and start being great at who you are, because that is what the world needs. We need you to be great at being you and then everything else will just start to lift up thank you so much dom and you've done exactly that today you've inspired all of us and you've touched all of us today and you've given us a lot of things to reflect on and and go and work on so thank you so much from the bottom of our heart for coming on the show Uh, really appreciate your time and your insights today just wonderful thank you so much (music) 
Today's episode was brought to you by my new book, You're a Leader, Now What? The Proven Path to High Performance Leadership. The book contains many of the great lessons that we have learned together here on the Leadership Project podcast, together with lessons that I've collected over my 30-year career as a leader. The book is aimed towards first-time leaders, but really there's something in there for everyone. If you would like to show your appreciation for this show, we would greatly appreciate if you were able to go and get your copy of the book on Amazon as either an ebook or a paperback, and if you could leave us an honest review on Amazon. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Project podcast at mixbeers.com. A big call out to Faris Sadek for his sound design and editing of our audio and video content, and to the whole team at TLP. Joanne Goes On, Gerald Calabo, Rika Vadanes, and my wonderful supportive wife, Say Spears, who is also our operations manager. This show would simply not be possible without you. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and review at Apple Podcasts. You can catch the video podcast and our video of the week at the Leadership Project YouTube channel. And you can join the conversation at the Leadership Project Facebook community group. We look forward to bringing you more great content and interviews next week as we continue to learn together and lead together. In the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.